see this. I hope this will be the first of uh, many talks on the subject. I'm kind of gotten kind of passionate about machine learning in Drupal. So today I'm going to talk about machine learning in Drupal with TensorFlow.js. Component module and TensorFlow.js. And a little bit about, about myself. I've been a Drupal developer for 12 years, I'm working uh, on government agency Drupal websites, which I just started to do, um, working on healthcare, Drupal websites, machine learning applications, and general software engineers. I, I've been doing programming for more like 25 years. I started out in Perl, moved into PHP, and I was at, at, uh, there at the beginning of the web. Um, right now, I'm currently a senior Drupal developer at ECS, which uh, is a company that uh, does contracts for government agencies. Um, I previously worked at uh, Tech Systems as a contractor at Florida Blue. And I also worked uh, for uh, Jitesh Doshi at Spinspire at Florida Blue. And I also worked at Scribe Fusion uh, for seven months, which is uh, a uh, child company of NLP Logics, which is a local company that does uh, machine learning enhanced applications. And excuse me. And that's where I first began uh, uh, getting into machine learning because that was working on an OCR <coughs> application that was enhance with machine learning to improve accuracy. Today, what we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you a little intro to machine learning and how it is used in Drupal or is not, as the case may be. Um, what is machine learning and what is deep learning? What's the difference? Um, what is TensorFlow JS and a little bit about the history of TensorFlow? Uh, understanding the component modules, which uh, was released, I believe, in January, and it's a really powerful module, and that's what's enabling me to be able to do this pretty easily to integrate machine learning into Drupal. And then I'll, I'll do some uh, demos and show, show you how to set up components and uh, using tensorflow.js and then looking to the future what this can be used for and then some of the resources that you can uh, take a look and check out. So what is machine learning? I mean we've all heard about it. It's been in the news quite a bit and machine learning focuses on applications that learn from experience and improve their decision-making or predictive accuracy over time. That's a definition given by IBM. Um, it's not really computer program that, that thinks, or it's, it's not like you're, if you think of AI as uh, true intelligence, machine learning is, is more of a way to train a computer application to get more accurate in its prediction of different things. And it has a lot of uses. And this is Andrew Neen. And he says, just as electricity transformed almost everything 100 years ago, today I think AI will transform in the next several years. And that's why it calls machine learning the new electricity, because it's gonna really, well, already has uh, made uh, great changes in the way things are done, especially on the web. And uh, Andrew Ning is probably the top AI machine learning uh, person in the world. He's an expert, he uh, teaches at Stanford. 
He's also the founder of Coursera and his machine learning class, which is 12 weeks, was the first class that I took in uh, machine learning. And it just teaches you the basics. I mean, the intuition between behind machine learning and, and how it works, very mathematical. Um, I have a background in psychology with the emphasis on statistics. And that's why I think AI, I mean, machine learning really appealed to me because it was using that same statistical knowledge. And if I remember taking graduate courses in uh, neural networks, probably in the 1990s, and there was just no computational computer powerful enough to enact those ideas. But machine learning has really come a long way since then. And it's just uh, transforming the world. These are some of the places that you've seen um, machine learning. And NVIDIA played a key role in this because the GPU, <laughs> the graphic processing, uh, <laughs> Graphic, graphic processing unit um, was re really what enabled uh, machine learning to evolve because the computations can be, the GPU is originally done for, used for um, computer gaming and they had to do a lot of mathematical uh, calculations for uh, three, three dimensional uh, representation of graphics and that involved matrix algebra, and that's what machine learning really Also, they announced the Omniverse this year. They're, they're getting pretty, uh, uh, they want to connect a whole, uh, all the virtual worlds in, in the world together into one common place you can, uh, you can interact there. Um, and Megatron is their new, <laughs> their new supercomputer that they're uh, kind of bundling. A lot of calculations really quickly. I think it was like eight gigabytes a second. Um, Tesla uses machine learning and self-driving cars. Uh, Facebook, uh, they came out with PyTorch, which is an ML framework and uh, for facial recognition. So they've done a lot with that. LinkedIn uses it for um, job, job recommendations. So those are some of the big uses cases for products. And it's not only uh, touching on national uh, companies, but also right here in Jacksonville, Florida, there's another number of companies that use machine learning. Uh, Duos Technology, um, they have a video inspection uh, portal for trains, so the trains can go through it and they can look for worn out parts um, and all kinds of other structural issues with the trains, just to check them. Um, NLP Logics, and that's the parent company uh, of uh, Scribe Fusion. And so they do a, uh, several machine learning applications, um, machine learning enhanced OCR applications, uh, fraud detection systems, and their own recruiting recruiter system. Guidewell, which is also known as Florida Blue, um, I worked on a project doing uh, integrating a recommendation engine for customers aging into Medicare, and add the warrant is uh, machine learning uh, solutions for advertising. So those are a few of the companies here that actually do machine learning. Um, types of uh, machine learning. So this is kind of a introduction to it. Uh, most of the machine learning is actually what is called supervised learning. And that's where you have certain action and you know the outcome, you know the result. And so with the large data set, you can actually train an algorithm to learn from that. 
because through each iteration, uh, what, what the machine learning tries to do is, is it will try and figure out the best weights for the values in the computation to best predict the outcome. And then the outcome can be checked and they can see what the difference is. So they can figure out how much error is. And then the weights are adjusted and those new weights become the new input, in, uh, input and it goes back in, in and learns. Um, unsupervised learning is where the outcome is not known. And that might be like um, anom anom anomaly uh, detection, uh, looking for values that don't fit in. And also um, something called factor analysis, where you can look for how items group together. Uh, you can also, um, there's uh, algorithms like uh, Kth nearest neighbors, where you try and predict which group uh, a, an individual uh, data point belongs to. And it can go through and iterate and figure out uh, the best group to put each data point in. And again, it's all trying to minimize the error. And a uh, subfield of that is deep learning, which is the neural networks. And this is the main part that TensorFlow really works on is uh, neural networks trying to mimic the way uh, the brain works. And I will be going over that a little bit more. Um, and with machine learning, the language most used uh, is, is Python. So it's a high level language, very similar to PHP. Um, it has a, a package manager like Composer called PIP. So you can install different dependencies. Uh, some of the dem uh, really crucial uh, dependencies include NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, Handus, Matplotlib, Keras, TensorFlow, and SciTorch. And um, one, of the, one of the nice things about uh, Python is they use uh, Jupyter Notebooks for now Google CoLab, which is an interactive in-browser editor. So you can actually uh, go into a browser and you can run lines of code one at a time to see that it does and get some output. And it's uh, you can also put notes directly in there. You can put pictures, you can put links. And so it becomes very interactive and those notebooks are, are great to use. Uh, Python. But that's one of the problems with machine learning is that it's mainly done in Python and Drupal developers are mainly PHP. So you either have to uh, learn a new language like Python, or you can also learn Java or R or Scala, uh, but there's another language that's uh, really being used now for machine learning, and that's JavaScript. Okay, this is a little intro to deep learning. Uh, Deep learning, again, is a subfield of machine learning concerned with algorithms inspired by the structure and function of the brain called artificial neural networks. These over here are the, sorry about the images, they don't seem to be that clear when blown up so big. Um, this is a, a neural network and you have on the left hand side, you have an input layers. These input layers are what the, uh, the model is being trained on. These could be images, these could be text. Um, it could be video, it could be anything. Uh, 
those inputs are coming in, but you have to find a way to actually represent those in a numerical way. Like for images, well, you have, you know, pixel by pixel. Uh, so you can uh, have like a 28 by 28 color pixel, pixel. So that image would re be representative by a uh, three dimensional matrix, 28 by 28 by, uh, well, 255 is the number of colors. The middle layer is the hidden layer. And this is where the calculations go, go on. And these can be, you can have the simplest, you could have one hidden layer or you could have multiple. And these are also like filters. And as they filter through here, weights are assigned for each layer. And then it's passed on to the next one. And, you know, the, it's filtered through there and so on until you get to the output layer, which is going to be your result. Like this one, if there's four, four nodes, four output nodes, um, these might be, it might be a classification task. So each one of these would be a different uh, classification of an object. And uh, each one of these layers that, well, the hidden layer and the output layer, they have what are called activations, uh, activation functions. Um, and it's just a certain uh, function that determines whether this is going to, you know, how it's going to affect the weights. Are there any, am I going too fast or are there any questions? So how is Drupal using this technology? Now Drupal tries to be at the cutting edge, um, for example, like trying to go decouple and use you know, React or Vue or uh, Angular as a front end. Um, but what about machine learning? How is this being integrated into Drupal? Well, currently Drupal has three main learning modules available for use. Um, machine learning libraries, Drupal Compute, Recommend their API. And what these actually do is just let you use, have access to using Python or JavaScripts in the background. And it uses a queue system to kind of, uh, once the Python program uh, returns the answer, it goes back into the queue and it's pulled off the queue by uh, Drupal. And so you can continue on with whatever uh, computation you were doing. But these are available for Drupal 7 only. They haven't been ported to Drupal 8. Ago, I saw this, so I contacted the maintainer, and he was no longer maintaining them. And I was going to port them to Drupal 8, and that's what I I started to do at the beginning of this year. But then I saw the compute or the component module, um, and I saw that that was the way of actually a better way of doing machine learning. So instead of or Java, you could actually use uh, JavaScript, which most Drupal developers are pretty familiar with. And Drupal interacts very well with, with uh, JavaScript. And uh, besides these three, three modules, there's a number of other ones, but they're mainly using their more of APIs to like Azure uh, machine learning uh, APIs. So you can actually do remote, submit information to the cloud and get whatever answer is back. But that's not, it's not really open source and it's also not doing it right there. Um, and you have to depend on something else. 
So I thought it would be better to use JavaScript and maintain the open source. Um, like Acquia has a, a personalization where the website that you're visiting will actually look at how you're, what parts of the website you're looking at and recommend and change the menus to kind of accommodate to that. So the alternate that I'm proposing is to use a component module uh, plus TensorFlow JS. Uh, the component module, like I said, I think it came out in December, or January, and it allows you to use JavaScript within a block. And you can also do the JavaScript configuration in the block configuration itself. And so it's set up to work, uh, Drupal is set up to work with JavaScript because uh, you can also use uh, uh, behaviors. And so there's, there's a lot of good things about using JavaScript instead of uh, Python. Now, TensorFlow uh, JS is a fully developed JavaScript library. It, it's very powerful. And what they did, I'll go into the history of uh, uh, TensorFlow in, in a moment, but it uses the WebGL to access the GPU for processing. And it's uh, well supported by open source community. And of course, Google is behind it. So uh, it, it's very well supported. And this is, it's a great way to do machine learning uh, using JavaScript. So in 2011, uh, Google Brain developed TensorFlow. And then in uh, 2015, they released TensorFlow to the public. And this was again using Python. Uh, and I think it was, it, it's programmed in C++. Um, and it, it really started to be used. Um, and in 2017, Google released uh, deeplearn.js, which was their first attempt uh, or looking at because they were kind of curious, well, JavaScript is really used by a lot of programmers. So can we somehow utilize uh, JavaScript to do machine learning? And that's where deeplearn.js came out. And in 2018, it was working out so well they merged deeplearn.js with TensorFlow to become tensorflow.js. And uh, it, the ability to use uh, WebGL and to access the CPU and everything, it is just, it really speeds it up quite a bit. And 2019, they also re uh, released TensorFlow Lite which is a light version designed for IoT devices. So like Raspberry Pis, Jetson Nanos, uh, Google uh, Corel dev boards, all those can actually use TensorFlow light to do things like, uh, especially computer vision. I just actually bought, I bought a OPD spatial camera through a Kickstarter and it actually has a processor on board that even speeds up things uh, faster than that. So uh, now, like, are there any questions on that? I think we have one from uh, Trivi asking if it's if this is all just in Drupal seven uh, only. No, no, this is, this is uh, designed for Drupal 8 and 9. Uh, and I also, I just started a uh, tensorflow.js project on Drupal, and it's for uh, Drupal, Drupal 9, well, 8 and 9. So. Okay, so the component module just came out. Uh, in uh, 
January, like I said, and it's really changed things quite a bit. Is create a module. So I've created a module called TensorFlow. And then within TensorFlow, you can have different components. Each one of these components, you can think of them like as a, a plugin block. So once you uh, set up these components in this module, they will then be available to be placed in a block, just like a plugin block would be if you programmed one in and put it in there. Uh, and you can also configure them. And the configuration, of course, is done through YAML. And you have both uh, uh, the tensorflow.info.yaml is for the whole module. And it's just uh, defining your dependencies. And then each one of these also have their own their own um, YAML file and component file to define them. And the three files that you need is, is uh, for each component is you need a component file and an index.html. This, this kind of optional because there's another way to do it because you are creating blocks so you can actually place these blocks in a page. Um, but you can also use the index.html and this is just whatever you, you want, you can define the, the template name. And then of course you have to have your, your uh, TensorFlow script uh, that pulls in TensorFlow and uh, does whatever it's gonna do. All right, this is a basic YAML uh, for the tensorflow.info.yaml file. And you just define the name's typical YAML file. Uh, description of what it's doing, uh, its module, and the core version requirement. I'm using the, uh, the one that's being used now, so it's good for both eight and nine. And the, the, you define the dependency, and which is uh, just the component module itself. So I have uh, a component called uh, TensorFlow One right here, and you can see I have the uh, the component file for this component. Um, again, you have the name, description, template. This is here is where you can define what you're going to call the actual uh, file that uh, holds the HTML. And then you define your different uh, JavaScript files, your dependencies that you're going to pull in. So here I'm pulling in uh, TensorFlow from uh, the CDN and it, it's an external file and it's minified. And I'm also pulling in a uh, plotly just for a graph on this one. And then the TensorFlow script, which is what contains the, uh, the code for this machine learning component. Uh, the form configuration, um, This is where you can actually define uh, configuration variables that are going to show up in your block configuration. And so once you have these defined, and you uh, you of course have to
you have to enable the module. So when you enable the module, it actually uh, makes your uh, components discoverable. And then your, your block layout. What I also, I didn't, this is another. HTML code in here. I did it both ways. I'll, I'll show you the other way of doing it in the blocks. So I have this page linear regression. Um, just note two. So now, if I wanted to place that block, I could actually go into here. and just place the block into the content. You can put it in the sidebar, you can put it wherever you want, wherever a block can go, you can place this, this block. And if we go into uh, the configuration, here again, we see here's where that, the number of epochs um, you can set this actually in this uh, the epochs is the number of iterations it goes through because uh, over time as it the prediction gets better and better so you get kind of a, a sloping lot uh, kind of a, a just a line that goes down to approach zero and um, so you have to play around with the number of uh, epochs that you want to do because each of those take each epoch takes time to do the calculation. So depending on the number of variables and features you have, it can really uh, vary a lot how long it takes. And then I'm also restricting this block just to node two. So it's only going to show up for node two. And once you have that in place, and on this page, you can have the output either go to the screen or also uh, TensorFlow likes to go to the console so you can just log it. So this is actually running through the epochs. Um, let me go through. That's fiction. Okay, so what this example is, is this, a, a simple linear regression example. So this is a, a trains a model to infer the relationship between numbers where y equals 2x minus 1. You might recognize this as the slope of, you know, the linear regression uh, mx plus b, the slope of the line plus the y-intercept. Um, so you could do this through regular statistics, but this is this is an example of using machine learning to to by just looking at these six data points and running calculations to try and figure out. Again, the the key thing is it's trying to figure out the best line, best prediction that um, uh, results in the least amount of error. So if you drew a line through these, uh, you can see only this one would be a little bit off of it. 
So it's just trying to figure out where that line should be placed. And if you do the actual calculations uh, statistically, um, this is what you would come out. So when you predict that, uh, predict y when uh, x equals 10. So if the, so it'd be way up here or something uh, at 18.92. So that's what the actual value is. And as you saw, I had at the end of this, because what this is, and here's the actual prediction. So uh, this model is predicting that the value is going to be uh, 18.9096, so 18.91 and the actual value is 18.9238. So not that far off. And again, this is the simplest type of, this is still a neural network because we have one input, which is the value of X. The hidden layer is gonna be that weight that's um, assigned to, uh, in the calculation, uh, 2x minus 1. So it's trying to figure out what the value of 2x, 2 should be. And uh, so, and then the output layer is that the actual numerical value that it's going to predict, which is 18, uh, 18.91. And again, this, this model is just sequential with one layer with one neuron uh, using mean squared error. And an optimizer is, there's different optimizers in machine learning that you can use. This is a stochastic gradient descent, which is a real common one. But there's other ones such as Adam um, is another popular one. And those are just trying to optimize the values to get the best prediction. And the loss function, that's basically your loss function approaches zero as your accuracy approaches one. So you actually want the loss function to be as small as possible. And so here you can see at epoch one, it starts out nine four. And it, pretty much you can see it steadily decreases. Again, we're only doing your data points here are six numbers. And so the loss value at the end is 0.1365. So it did pretty good. Let's go to another example. This is a classic iris classification problem. We have four input layers. Uh, these are iris flowers. So from these four values, we're trying to predict which one of these three flowers it actually is. Um, so again, these are numerical values going in. And we've just put in a layer of five nodes. So just one hidden layer with five nodes. And again, it's going to go through all of those. And it ends up at 0.117. So actually, this one I actually printed out the the loss as it goes through there.
and this was the so the actual value I actually configured this one in. So here I just actually put which flower for it to predict. So this time I just, just to show the way that you actually configure that. And again, that's gonna be in your form configuration. So I set up one called predict, it's a select title and these are the options that you can select. Um, and this is actually the tensorflow.js and you, uh, this is a standard form format for doing tensorflow is you load in the data set. This I'm just loading in a file. Um, TensorFlow also has a uh, set up tensorflow.hub, uh, which has a number of different models you can load and also make some data sets available. Um, and then you transform the data however you need it. It's kind of an ETL process. Uh, you define the model. So this is where I'm setting up the different uh, layers. Uh, the first layer here is, uh, well, this is actually the, the hidden layer. And this is what's called the, uh, the output layer. And it's using an activation function called softmax, which is the one that you use is you're defining which, which uh, uh, category it belongs in or which classification in. And uh, those different, if it's predicted to be in one, more likely to be predicted more in one, they'll be less likely in the others. So it kind of adjusts for that because the total value I think adds up to one. And you also define uh, the loss function. Uh, the last one we looked at used category, uh, category, uh, uh, mean squared error. This one's using uh, categorical uh, cross entropy. It's because we're doing categories. So this is the one that uh, you use for the loss function. And this is using uh, an optimizer called Adam and this training value. It's, it's, it, this is a measure of how much the, uh, the model will burn through each iteration. You can adjust the training value and, and there's, um, that's feature engineering or uh, optimization. And uh, you can kind of play with these values, see which one works best. Uh, and then actually it uses uh, a weight to actually, to actually train the data and the functions are defined um, and here's where it de decides which category to put it in. It looks at the category that has the highest uh, value and uh, then shows this just showing the predicted value. Rick, I have uh, just two questions in the chat queue. Um, okay. He's asking, and I think it was the earlier model, uh, the slope intercept model, if there was a way for him to download uh, that or use it as an example. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, actually, I've uploaded, I haven't updated uh, the module, uh, the project for a while, but that these examples are in the project that I've set up on Drupal. So these will all be available. Awesome. And then uh, 
ponies, I'm not certain of <laughs> their name, uh, but they were wondering if there was an optimal number of units for the middle layer, I believe, on the uh, module that you were just demonstrating. It, it's it's probably going to depend on how many input uh, inputs you have, how many features. Uh, so there's no real optimal number. Uh, there, there's also, you can put a lot more in and then part of the problem with doing machine learning is you have the bias variance problem. If you put enough nodes in there, then it, and you run it through enough iterations, it can almost perfectly predict the values but you're using a training set. But if you take that different set of data, it might not generalize to it. So, uh, and uh, so for that bias problem, well, that's a uh, variance problem. Um, you can use regulation, which basically uh, kind of cuts down on the value, the, the weight that each of the nodes has in calculating it. Because sometimes, again, it can get too accurate. And so you can use something called dropout where it'll randomly drop out nodes. So that you might need more nodes. So it's really going to vary how many nodes. Um, one other one real quick. And I'm just, now I set this up again, you can set the num number of epochs. And in this one, TensorFlow also has a tensor viz application. So this is actually showing you real time. It's training, training the model and you can see the loss function as it goes. So this showing the number of epochs. And this is using the Manist handwriting. Uh, this is 65,000 handwritten images of, of digits zero to 10. And so we're training on those 10 digits because we're gonna see how well it can predict what I draw in this box at the end. So the training is done. And you can see here with, with 18, we're getting kind of down here low, but it's not quite. So this prediction is probably not going to be perfect. Now, the, the other thing, TensorFlow does a great job. I told you that there is 65,000 images used for this example. Um, but if you have 65 images and you're loading each one of those, Boy, that's going to be a lot of requests, isn't it? So guess what they did? Because can, can anyone guess what they did to, so you only have to do one connection to get all those images? It's a technique used in CSS. I don't have my chat turned on, so. Um, Michael McGinn is saying concatenate. Concatenate. Close. I mean, that's the general idea, but it's, it's creating a sprite. Just like they do in CSS, you combine all the images into one image and then you slice the particular image you're looking for out. And that's what TensorFlow does with images, which it's which is why this is so fast. So I actually went and got this one sprite for use in it. And so now if I, I was, thought it was a seven. And again, there's a lot of error in this and I still haven't gotten
Hey, got it. My handwriting's, I guess, not so good. I guess using a mouse. Usually it has problems with sixes because it thinks it's a five. So this is a little interactive way uh, to using this because TensorFlow, can so you could actually have video I'm working on incorporating that into Drupal as well. Um, it can also, like I said, handle audio. I have another demonstration, not quite ready, but it's a mandolin tuner. So I can actually use this, use it to tune my mandolin, um, uh, the original one. Uh, and, and that's using another JavaScript uh, library, it's called ML5, and it works with, uh, uh, I think it's P5 or PS5, um, which is a JavaScript. It's kind of an abstraction. It just makes it easier for like artists to use it um, and designers to use it. It's not so, it's like a, a higher level API for machine learning, um, which is really good. I think it has a lot of uh, possible uses and stuff. And I'm just beginning to play around with this, but uh, I think it's, it's gonna be really powerful. Oops. So some of the things that I'm looking to do is uh, to uh, create a recommender for Drupal Commerce. So it could actually look at products that people purchase and figure out, you know, what other people might like. I mean, it's, it's a recommendation engine is like going to Netflix and they recommend movies based on uh, what you like to look at. And they just look at other people who looked at that movie so those movies might be of interest to you too. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do uh, recommendation engines. I think that has a lot of uh, possibilities. Uh, a chat bot uh, using uh, natural language processing because uh, uh, machine learning is very good at processing text and language. Um, that's how you, if you notice on Google now, when you when you start typing something in an email, it will almost finish your thought, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it, I think it really does learn from what you typically put in your email. So it'll learn more and more as time goes by. Um, there, there is a, a image and video tagger that can actually look at uh, images and figure out which ob uh, objects are in there and put uh, tags in them. And same with, with videos. Uh, but I'm sure there's a lot more uses for uh, TensorFlow in the future. And I plan to continue on and uh, I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. Um, and here's a couple of resources, uh, some videos, uh, introduction to TensorFlow. So I went over rather, this is really a lecture on how to use TensorFlow, but just how to use it within Drupal, because um, that's a whole nother series of lectures, I think, there. Um, and also uh, Drupal, how to use the Drupal component module. Uh, Jitesh Doshi of uh, Spinspire put out a couple of videos, and that's what really uh, caught framework for, for me to do this presentation. Uh, do I have any other questions?
Well, thank you for all attending. I hope you have learned a little bit and uh, I hope this does get you a little bit excited about machine learning and what it can do. Uh, just hope that Drupal can kind of uh, catch up and get back into the game with this. Um, and and so Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I want to thank you for the presentation. Can I, can I have one question? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, great presentation. I didn't really think that components could be used for that. <laughs> so, uh, good learning, but, um, do, do you have any like, uh, thoughts on how the Drupal like kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> Like, can you have like some, uh, you know, like in the dreaming area, what Drupal could be like, how you could integrate in, in the Drupal universe, uh, could to move forward to like use machine learning. I know like this is very, like, it's a lot of specific kind of use cases that needs to be custom, uh, you know, like custom approach to, you know, so solving some of those problems, but do you see anything that, for example, I mean, Drupal is good at using this, uh, you know, like even their architecture and kind of engage those two together, like in terms of getting data from Drupal, uh, I don't know, like using nodes kind of for, or like, you know, like even getting data from the fields and integrating those two together, like marry more those two, uh, I don't wanna say platform, but you know, to universes together. Did you have like some thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I guess I'm looking at how Drupal, I mean, can integrate with like TensorFlow um, and also other things. I mean, through this, I think the component module is great. It's, it's going to open up a lot of possibilities there because um, it makes it a lot easier to bring in JavaScript on the pages and be put into, um, you know, different blocks, different areas. And, you know, some of the things that I think might be able to do is it might be a value is, you know, the little chat box where it could, it doesn't have to be a human person on the end. It could actually be, you know, a machine learning trained uh, bot that could respond in the appropriate way based on the domain that you're within. Uh, because there's also a thing, TensorFlow makes a lot of models available, like uh, image recognition, you know, recognizing object rec recognition in images. Uh, they have one model that has like, uh, you know, again, it, it's thousands of images, and I think they have about a thousand categories but you can use something called transfer learning where you use that model because that model has already looked at different objects. And if you introduce a new object, it, uh, the model can use what it learned about other objects to uh, extract features to recognize this new object. So the training time goes way down. So you kind of bootstrap, uh, you know, new, new images. Uh, for example, if you have a facial recognition where you want to recognize someone, well, if it's got a big database where it recognizes, you know, a number of different people, you put a new one in there, well, it can learn, it can use what it's learned from those previous ones on the new images, and it doesn't have to go through um, all the calculations again. And so it can pull out the features real quickly. So, I mean, so I, I guess it is just finding a way um, that Drupal can really use this. Um, you know, I think like a, a recommendation engine for Drupal Commerce, I think that's that's a no brainer. I mean, that should be in there. Is that, I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I mean, it's that, that's, because of a lot of those possibilities. I mean, that, that's, I'm just, you know, I'm like thinking about kind of universe, uh, like uni more universal approach to like more, um, you know, how this key, because I mean, I'm, there's definitely good use cases for like e-commerce and actually I, you know, like uh, I got requests from customer that uh, wants to have 
like image recognition for door handles. And, you know, so I look at the, uh, you know, AWS solutions and, you know, because they have, you know, those tools, but they are all paid and expensive and, uh, exactly. you know, but, yeah. you know, and we kind of recognize the doors, but we never could like really differentiate the door handles <laughs> so, because you need a lot of data to. Right. And, and TensorFlow, um, the organization, they're, like I said, they established a TensorFlow hub. So they're making the models available that have been pre-trained. So you can use those models again for transfer learning. And so I think that's just really going to grow because again, you know, Google has made this uh, open source, which is a great advantage. Yeah, it's and, great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, and again, in e-commerce, you know, there are some companies who do offer um, recommendation engines, but you got to pay the price. Yeah. So, but, you know, we're, we're part of an open source community. So how can we contribute to that? So it's, you know, we'll come up with a way of uh, making an open source uh, recommendation engine. And that's why I'm kind of putting my efforts into doing it using this component library, because I think it's more Drupal-like to do it that way than, you know, uh, because it is open source and JavaScript is something that most. Yeah, I mean, definitely, yeah. It's, um, yeah, I appreciate the great work, yeah, it's. Uh, thank you, so, yeah. Um, Give the floor well, back and appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry. laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So are there any other questions? I know we're a little bit over time, but um, I'm I can hang out here for a few minutes. There was one from ponies who looks like they're not here anymore, but uh, they were wondering if there were any also any regular Drupal uh, and machine learning groups that you knew of. Mm. No, I actually, I don't know of any. Um, hmm. That might be a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I see this as a great way. And I think that'd be a great idea to start up a Drupal users group focused around this. I mean, I think for me, this is what I really want to focus in. Yeah, because uh, after my second week of work, second or third week, I was asked to go to a lunch with leadership. And so I met with the CTO of the company I work for, ECS, and uh, the chief technology for machine learning and, and uh, data science. In fact, the company had just started up uh, a data science initiative to use it more within governmental agency websites. And he actually hooked me up with the person running that program. And um, so I'll probably be working on that as well. And they, they use Drupal as their uh, content management system for all these different contracts that they have. So that's exciting. Nice. Yeah, I did a quick Google search and I didn't see too much. So maybe that's uh, definitely something we can look into in the future. Uh, and Michael McGinn was just asking if all the data, uh, does all the data stay local that's processed by TensorFlow JS? Well, you can, you can, it, again, it's done. Uh, so actually, I, it would probably just go into memory, I mean, locally, because all the calculations are done locally. Uh, I know there's like uh, data sets that you can access over the web and some that you can download uh, and set up. I downloaded a couple just to make it easier and quicker. Um, but the one that like the Menist, that was a remote one but that was just one request pulling off that, you know, some huge image. Um, each of the letters or, or uh, numbers are only 28 by 28. 
but it still adds up to a lot of uh, data, but it's all sent as, as one request. So uh, that would uh, remain, it just remains in local memory. And again, this can be applied to uh, video as well, real time video. And with this, you can you can do that. Uh, you can do real time object recognition uh, on video images, videos, um, and also segmentation, where it kind of blocks out uh, where the object is in the the image. And they've gotten very good uh, at processing images. Is called Yolo. You only look once. So it looks at the picture once and can calculate out what it is uh, by using that model. Anything else? Greg mentioned there's an AI channel on Drupal Slack. So that would be a good starting point, I think, for anybody uh, that's interested in AI and ML. So thanks, Greg. And then Michael McGinn asked a follow-up question. Um, maybe you've already answered it, uh, but meaning, he says, uh, meaning, does it phone home to Google for anything? Uh, no, this, I mean, you, you don't have to use uh, anything. No, it's, it's just using TensorFlow as the JavaScript library. So you just load it up. You can download it, of course. So, and, not depending on someone else, uh, especially for processing. All the processing is done through um, through the browser. And there's east, they've even done enhancements um, to the TensorFlow where it, you can actually process, uh, you can do simultaneous uh, parallel processing, if you like, because when you're you're uh, pre-processing the image in, you're using the CPU. It's only when you actually do the training is when you use the GPU. So it, there's actually a way that you can um, uh, get the, the pre-processing to use the GPU. And at the same time, you can uh, use the GPU to, to do the training. And you can set up pipelines. It's when you're doing the iteration, so it actually optimally utilizes it, the uh, processing power of the browser. So um, while you're actually training the data, it can be pre-processing uh, pre the next batch that's going to be put into the training. So it's uh, again TensorFlow is they're just doing great things with it. It's becoming very, very powerful. And the TensorFlow Lite, is, it's very lightweight, but you can do a lot of, it's not everything that TensorFlow has, but a lot of the things that you can do. Uh, so you can use it on IoT devices, which is another interest of mine. Did that kind of answer that? Yeah, from his comment in the chat, it looks like it did. I forgot to. Again, I, I uh, just want to say thanks, uh, Matthew, for setting this up and for helping me out. He helped me with, well, he did most of the presentation. I just filled in a few of the dots and uh, Chris McGrath at Esteemed as well. And uh, again, Jitesh Doshi, um, who was kind of one of my mentors, he got me the job at doing Drupal at Florida Blue. Uh, and he's the one who inspired me through working on the components module and just using that. And of course, my esteemed colleagues, all the people I talked to at Esteemed, uh, it's a great community and, and I love being part of it. Awesome. 
Well, yeah, it was really fun, Rick, and uh, appreciated you uh, hosting this for us. And we had quite a crowd, so I'm, I'm super excited. <clears throat> Excuse me for everybody else uh, who's here. Um, this will be released on our YouTube channel, uh, and I'll go ahead and post the notes there. And yeah, I'll post that on Slack in the community later, either today or uh, sometime Monday as well. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Hope, it, hope the rest of your day goes well. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Rick.